sorry for the delay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, or good evening, depending upon where you are. We have a sample of each of those uh, situations um, in our panel here today. My name is Kevin Gallagher. I'm the director of Boston University's Global Development Policy Center, or the GDP Center, as we like to call ourselves. Our mission is to advance policy oriented research on financial stability, human well being, and the environment across the world. And we're very excited and honored to co sponsor today's uh, panel discussion with the South Center, located in Geneva, uh, with, uh, headed by Carlos Correa, who uh, we'll hear from later on today. 200, uh, 2020 uh, hasn't been a very good year to all of us uh, in many ways. Of course, we've been racked by the COVID-19 crisis, which has in turn created a global economic crisis. The International Monetary Fund says this is the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression, close to 100 years ago. And of course, emerging market and developing countries, as we call them, have been the hardest hit. The International Monetary Fund sees the emerging market in developing countries is contracting by 5.7% this year, whereas the world economy will uh, only, contra only contract by a little over 3%. This translates into the fact that when developing countries need the fiscal space to fight the virus, protect the vulnerable, and mount a recovery, they lack it most. And this is accentuated by the international trade and investment treaty system where market concentration, complex supply chains, patents, export controls have stemmed the ability for the treatment of devices and now the vaccine to reach the majority of the world's poorest people. As we look forward into 2021, mm -hmm. it is clear that a renewed effort uh, is needed uh, to enable developing countries to have both the fiscal and the policy space to fight this virus and to make their economies more resilient to protect and mitigate those viruses and other external shocks that are inevitable to come into the future. This in part means some immediate and some intermediate reforms to trade and investment treaties. And to address this, the South Center and the GDP Center have assembled some of the world's most important experts, practitioners, policymakers, and scholars who think about this issue and work on this issue on a, day, on a daily basis. This public symposium that we're having today uh, is, is in some ways the culmination of a three-day workshop that the GDP Center ha has been having among a number of the world's leading scholars on trade, investment treaties, and access to medicines, where we've been looking at, uh, from a technical perspective, many of these issues and now want to engage uh, on a global stage with folks uh, about these issues more broadly. I've asked each of the five experts that I'm about to uh, introduce to make a short set of initial five minute remarks where I ask, what are the most important immediate and intermediate reforms that are needed to the trade and investment treaty system in order to enable countries to be able to produce and consume medicines and medical devices, and obviously now the vaccine uh, in a manner that is just and affordable for emerging market and developing countries. I'll introduce all of the speakers now so that we can just flow right into the panel. Uh, and I really just wanna thank everyone, all of you for coming from the audience and our different panelists as well. First, we'll hear from Mustakim Degama. He's currently the counselor with the South African mission in Geneva and accredited to the World Trade Organization and the United Nations. He previously worked at the Department of Trade and Industry in South Africa and headed the Legal International Trade and Investment Directorate. Uh, he was also previously the South African representative to the WTO Trade Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Council. He holds a doctorate and he's appointed as an extraordinary professor at the University of Pretoria. Follow, following Mr. Kim, we'll hear from Deborah Gleason. Deborah is a senior lecturer in the School of Psychology and Public Health at La Trobe University on health systems, health policy, and public health focus. She holds the honorary role of Deputy Governor of the Political Economy of Health Special Interest Group of the Public Health Association of Australia. Then we'll hear from Yusef, Yusef Wada, excuse me. He's an associate professor at the UK, UK ZN School of Law, Howard College Campus, Durban 
and holds, among other qualifications, a doctorate in law, which he obtained at UKZN with his doctoral thesis entitled Access to Life-Saving Medication in South Africa, the Case for Legislative Reform. He was admitted to the High Court of South Africa and practiced there from 1978 to 1994. We'll also hear from Martin Howell Fried. He's the coordinator of the Initiative for Vaccine Research at the World Health Organization in Geneva, Switzerland. In his position, he, Dr. Fried provides leadership to the WTO's activities on vaccine research, including development of vaccine research policies, strategies, and priorities. And finally, we'll hear from my co-sponsor, uh, Dr. Carlos Correa of Argentina. He's the executive director of the South Center, where he's been the executive director since 2018. Uh, before that, he was special advisor on trade and intellectual property at the South Center. And he's definitely considered the most renowned international authority on intellectual property, health, and technology issues. Really want to thank all of you in the audience for joining us today. As I said, I've asked a specific question of each of these panelists, and I'll ask them to go in, in succession in the order that I introduce them. And then we should have a good amount of time to have a global conversation about these most important issues. If you look at, the, at your Zoom screen, in the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see a little note that says Q&A. For those of you who'd like to ask a question, go into the Q&A box and first and foremost, introduce yourself. Tell us your name and your affiliation so we can uh, have this be a little bit more personal than sitting here uh, on Zoom across the world. And then type in a short question. Following the four panel, the panelists and their comments, uh, I will then go into the Q&A box and field number of questions and ask them to the group and allow them to respond to you in succession. Well, thank you very much. Uh, now we'll start with Mustakim Dagama from South Africa. Uh, thanks, uh, Kevin, and uh, uh, thanks very much for uh, inviting me. Uh, I think South Africa's had a long-term strategic connection, both on the side of public health and also uh, for investment treaties. I, many of the viewers will recall that South Africa had reformed its investment laws and started canceling uh, so-called old order investment treaties. And so from that perspective, uh, the dialogue about investment treaties and its intersection with uh, public interest matters has been on the agenda for quite a long time. And I just quickly recall in the last 10 years or so, we would have seen uh, many reform initiatives in, in UNCTAD, uh, in UNCITRAL, Working Group 3, this is uh, still continuing. And we see the same, uh, both on a bilateral and a regional basis. And so from that perspective, it is important to emphasize that there are <clears throat> many moving parts to this uh, discussion. And so uh, as the question suggests, perhaps we should look at the most immediate uh, types of reforms that we could instill. And given the fact that we are in a pandemic, uh, I think the most emphatic uh, approach would be uh, to try and agree um, uh, to suspend uh, all uh, uh, treaty-based uh, investment state arbitration uh, matters related to COVID-19. Um, this is obviously uh, an, an option which has been put out. Um, uh, certainly um, not the easiest thing to do, but uh, from an international and immediate policy perspective, uh, this is something that could start to address the policy risks that countries may face uh, when they do take measures uh, to address COVID-19. Um, it's also been suggested uh, that uh, we look at uh, the application of uh, interna international law defenses uh, and clarify these. These are perhaps more long-term uh, discussions that we should have. And so uh, the doctrine of necessity, for example, comes up here. Um, there are many conditionalities in using this particular doctrine. And when we do look at case law, we see that um, cases are um, not always the same because panels uh, take uh, different views uh, when looking at this particular uh, defense. Um, I'm also sure that uh, we have uh, the national security exception that one could look at both in the context of the current uh, pandemic uh, and also for the future, specifically um, Article 73B um, of the TRIPS agreement uh, has a specific national security exception which can be invoked uh, by countries. But as we've seen recently in several cases, the uh, Russia uh, transit case and the uh, Qatar Saudi Arabia cases, um, this um, 
this particular uh, exception is not automatic. So a state may invoke it, but a panel may still review whether or not the basis for invoking uh, this particular defense would have been uh, founded. Uh, another option would be a joint interpretive statements um, by, by, by countries. Um, and specifically, governments can consider um, acting jointly uh, in situations of necessity uh, to clarify that uh, certain actions taken in the interest uh, of addressing COVID-19 uh, cannot be found to be in breach of treaty obligations. Uh, so this is certainly also uh, an immediate option that could be looked at. Uh, and then, of course, um, because treaties embed uh, the concept of consent, it may be that countries could also consider to withdraw consent because uh, under a treaty, a country um, essentially makes an offer to any a qualifying investor to take up uh, uh, a matter in the future should that investor accept the offer. And so it may be possible at this current time that states could withdraw their offers uh, preemptively for this period. Um, and, and this could also preempt um, actions being brought by, um, by investors. It does not exclude necessarily uh, the uh, possibility, but it does uh, create uh, more uh, jurisdictional hurdles and enforcement hurdles if a panel should find or if an arbitral tribunal should find that they have jurisdiction. Kevin, and just uh, ending up, uh, everyone would also know that South Africa, together with a few other uh, proponents, had uh, proposed a waiver from TRIPS obligations. Part of that uh, particular waiver is also uh, a, a peace clause uh, that suspends the possibility to bring um, actions under the dispute settlement um, understanding. And so uh, part of this uh, particular offering is that um, countries may also benefit from invoking specific types of um, anti-dispute um, agreements, uh, including so-called peace clauses. So from that perspective, we also think that this could be uh, something useful. But um, in the ongoing phase, a greater clarity as to the scope and the application of investment treaties, greater clarification for measures taken um, in the public interest, uh, public health measures. Uh, these are all part of the current reform um, that would uh, essentially go into the future. I leave it at that and I'm happy to come back to some of the uh, issues that I mentioned. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you very much for those profound comments and uh, for leading by example for your fellow panelists uh, for keeping within time so we have uh, plenty of time for a, a global conversation. Our next speaker is Professor Deborah Gleason. Thank you very much, Kevin, and thank you, Mr. Keem, for your comments. Um, so we were asked to address the question, what reforms are needed to trade and investment treaties in order for emerging markets and developing countries to produce and gain access to essential medicines and treatments in the COVID-19 era? And I think that at this stage in the pandemic, it's very clear that the existing regime that we have doesn't serve us well. It doesn't enable speedy access to new products on a global scale or rapid up scaling up of production across the world to meet the immediate needs of 7.8 billion people. To improve access and to rapidly scale up supply in low and middle income countries, we need to ensure access to information, data and technologies we need to ensure that low and middle income countries are able to grow their domestic industries and we need transparency in pharmaceutical markets so that governments have the information that they need to be able to negotiate reasonable prices. And yet trade and investment treaties make each of these more difficult. So I'm going to discuss some of the barriers related to intellectual property and then some of the barriers related to other issues in trade agreements. The World Trade Organization's TRIPS agreement mandates monopoly rights, including 20-year patents, that enable pharmaceutical companies to exclude competitors from the market while charging high prices for their products. And while the TRIPS agreement includes flexibilities such as compulsory licensing and um, the security exception that Mustakeem mentioned earlier, these flexibilities are difficult to use and they take time to implement. Other free trade agreements add more barriers. For example, trade agreements negotiated by the US and the EU often include data exclusivity, which prevents regulatory agencies from using the clinical trial data submitted by the originator company 
to assess a marketing approval application for a generic or biosimilar product for a number of years. And unless there are specific exceptions for compulsory licensing, data exclusivity can prevent access to the product, even if the patent can be bypassed. Trade secrets protection is another important issue, and this has been ramping up in recent trade agreements. It's a particular problem for enabling access to vaccines and biologics, such as monoclonal antibodies. For these complex biologic products, it's not enough just to override the patent. To be able to make biosimilar versions of these products requires detailed knowledge of the process and the technologies used, and often access to things like cell lines that are used in the manufacturing process. So what can we do about these intellectual property barriers? I think the first thing to say is that it's very important um, for countries to support the TRIPS waiver that's been proposed by India and South Africa and which Mustakeen mentioned earlier. At the national level, countries need to ensure that they've removed any barriers to compulsory licensing, such as the requirement to negotiate first with the originator company before issuing a compulsory license. And they also need to make sure they have exceptions in place um, if they provide data exclusivity so that that doesn't provide an additional barrier. And nations can support initiatives for sharing intellectual property, like CTAP, the COVID-19 technology access pool, by requiring their pharmaceutical companies to contribute their intellectual property to the pool if they receive public funding. In the longer term, the intellectual property regime that's entrenched and perpetuated by trade agreements needs a more fundamental rethink. We need to consider alternative ways to um, fund research and development that don't depend on monopolies and high prices. So I want to touch before I um, finish on some other issues around trade agreements, um, some lesser known provisions that can reduce access to pharmaceuticals. Investor state dispute settlement um, is a big issue. Investor state dispute settlement mechanisms or ISDS enables foreign investors, including pharmaceutical companies, to contest government policies and laws by bringing a, a claim for compensation to an international tribunal if they perceive that their investor rights under an agreement have been breached. And the legal defence for these cases can be very expensive, often amounting to millions, even if a claim is unsuccessful, and the awards can be hundreds of millions or even billions of dollars. And the costs of fighting a claim can deter um, countries, share governments from taking actions that, um, that they fear might uh, cause a claim to be made, like issuing a compulsory licence, for example. There are also provisions in some trade agreements that make it difficult for governments to establish and support their domestic pharmaceutical industry. For example, government procurement rules can prevent government entities like health ministries or public hospitals from favouring local suppliers over foreign entities. Rules applying to state-owned enterprises, including state-owned generic medicine companies, can prevent them from receiving government assistance like grants, loans or R&D support. Some trade rules mandate disclosure of detailed information about government decision-making around pharmaceuticals, such as whether or not to list a drug on a national formulary, and they can provide pharmaceutical companies with opportunities to influence decision-making and contest decisions that are not in their favour. Some recent US trade agreements can limit the ability of regulatory agencies to require pharmaceutical agencies to provide financial data like sales, marketing or pricing data when they apply for marketing approval. And this can make it harder for countries to obtain transparency in pharmaceutical markets um, as envisaged under the WHO resolution on improving the transparency of markets for medicines, vaccines and other health products. And I think the uh, value of transparency has been really highlighted in the pandemics, as a lot of governments have poured massive amounts of public funding into the development of new medicines and vaccines, and yet the companies that produce them are still able to charge what they like for those products. So I think that there's a lot of areas that need to be reformed in trade and investment agreements and that we need to really closely scrutinise all of the different types of rules, not just intellectual property, and really think about um, what changes might need to be made to those rules in order to be able to have the policy space that we need uh, to 
enable access to, to medicines and vaccines and that rapid scaling up, uh, which will allow countries to support their local industries and to be able to make policy in the interests of their people. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And now I'll move to Professor Vada. Uh, thank you, uh, Kevin, and greetings to all participants. Uh, let me start by acknowledging the outstanding leadership role played at the WTO Trips Council by our fellow panelists, Dr. Mustaki Nagama, um, together with other co-sponsors, uh, South Africa, and in particular, has led the charge uh, on the proposal for the waiver of IP protection specific to COVID-19. If the global trade and investment regime is to be reformed to prioritize uh, public health and indeed public interest, uh, this is surely the key initiative of the moment. So I know a lot, a lot has been said about that and I won't uh, speak to that point. Uh, Deb has also talked about uh, some of the stringent provisions in the FTAs that uh, extend TRIPS protections, the TRIPS plus measures. Uh, and I agree completely that what is required is a rethink and perhaps overhaul of the trade and investment uh, regime uh, globally. Uh, so I'm going to just focus on two or three uh, fairly practical issues which I thought we might want to bring into the play. The first relates to um, the question of export bans in the context of COVID-19. Uh, it appears some 50 plus governments have placed export restrictions on COVID-19 health products. Uh, and it's important to note that this was not only limited to high income countries, but in fact, low income countries as well uh, impose such, some such bans. So one example, of course, is South Africa uh, had imposed bans in the early part of the pandemic on the export of certain health products, including uh, existing human vaccines, disinfectants, uh, face masks, and so on. Uh, and interestingly, this extended to a number of African countries as well. So, you know, they're out of the loop on that. Uh, of course, this ban has subsequently been lifted, uh, but it does highlight the problem of how those reactions in a pandemic can be detrimental to access, uh, you know, in, in some of the most needed areas. So uh, I think that uh, is an area that might be uh, looked at. Uh, secondly, uh, we are aware that at the current moment, there are a uh, few uh, negotiations ongoing for free trade agreements. And the one that uh, come to mind are the one between the US and Kenya, and I think uh, European Union and Indonesia. Uh, if these negotiations are to follow the path and the standard template that the US uh, TR uses in these negotiations, then we are very likely to see the inclusion of all these TRIPS plus provisions which impact negatively on public health and, and, and uh, public interest. So here I suggest that countries could uh, use the lessons of the scarcity and the shortages of, um, that we've experienced during the pandemic to um, bargain against the inclusion of these TRIPS plus provisions. And I think it's a good time to start now as, as any. And then on the third point uh, that was raised about ISDS, I think a lot has been said about that. It's also um, to be noted that during the pandemic, um, some problems of supply were addressed uh, by countries making use of, uh, you know, retooling some of their plants and producing the necessary equipment and so on. But uh, one of the problems is always going to be that many of these plants are owned by uh, foreign countries, you know, foreign owned, and countries could be uh, sued, you know, in terms of bil bilateral investment treaties or under the WTO agreement on uh, trade related in investment measures and so on. So here, uh, uh, and, you know, I think this must be said in the context that the responses and the reforms will have to be at multilateral, bilateral, and unilateral level. So at the unilateral level, um, interesting example of South Africa is uh, that in 2015, the South African government ended all bilateral investment treaties it, it had signed with European countries and uh, passed what is called the Protection of Investment Act. Now, among the changes to the country's foreign investment regime introduced by this act is the removal of the international investment arbitration uh, process at the ICSID, the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes, and replacing it with a couple of uh, provisions that are very, you know, um, 
country focused. Firstly, that dispute should be subject to the South African constitution, which you might be aware is, uh, has got fairly strong property protections. And secondly, and most important is that these disputes should in the first instance be brought before the domestic courts. Of course, the South African government may agree to international arbitration, but only after the domestic uh, processes have, have been exhausted. So this might be one um, other useful uh, approach to, uh, to consider. And I'll, I'll stop there. Yes. Thank you for, thank you so much. Uh, now we'll move on to Martin Howell-Frieda from the WHO. Well, thanks very much. It's, it's an honor to be following such experts on trade. And as you will see, I'm not an expert on trade, but what I have spent much of my life doing is technology transfer for vaccine and monoclonal antibody production in developing countries. And right now, our ability to treat COVID, and our ability to respond to COVID is very much dependent on vaccines and monoclonal antibodies. So I'm going to take a rather contrarian view to a lot that I've heard. I'm going to say that right now, there's a bottleneck but that bottleneck is being driven by production, not by intellectual property. Even if we could get all of the IP owners on earth to sign a covenant to not sue, this would not in the, in the next 12 to 24 months overcome the problem of supply of biologicals for COVID uh, treatment or for COVID prevention. Why? Well, first of all, biologicals, be they vaccines or monoclonal antibodies, this requires time to build a factory. It requires time to produce things, even if intellectual property is not present. So I'd like to take us back to 2009, to the last time we had a pandemic. And this was the H, um, H1N1 pandemic. And we saw a lot of problems that were related to treaties during H1N1. I'm going to bring up the first one. It is to do with genetically modified organisms. So we were trying to enable developing countries that had infrastructure to make vaccines, acquire the necessary strains to make an H1N1 vaccine. They couldn't because they had a domestic law preventing the importation of genetically modified organisms. Now these are pretty widespread such, uh, such laws. And we, as we're going to see in the next several months, the, several of the vaccine candidates that we have are genetically modified organisms. So how are the countries going to handle that? Then another one, which is, has not come up during COVID, but is, came up in the past, is likely to come up again, is whether pathogens are in Nagoya or not in Nagoya. So I'm happily walking into a space that most people would, would not dare tread. But had we been facing a situation of needing to sign the material transfer agreements and the, the agreements and how this is going to be used on COVID, we would have had a greater delay than we currently have. So one of the great successes that we have achieved in, this, in the COVID response was the time, the very, very rapid transfer of sequence and transfer of knowledge and information regarding COVID. So everything had been in place to prevent delays. This was very well done, but we could have been facing other delays. Now, I'd like to, to just touch on one or two things which, which have, have been mentioned. I, Deborah mentioned the, the need for us to be able to come trade secrets. Now, if we had um, manufacturers that were ready to receive uh, the, the patent, the know-how, on making a monoclonal antibody, but this did not come accompanied with the trade secrets of how to do it. Well, then we would still require two, three, four years to be able to make it. But are treaties able to impose the necessary transfer of trade secrets? And I think that this is one of the challenges we've seen now during COVID is that the, man, the, the originators are finding it easier to work with contract manufacturers and transfer their trade secrets to a contract manufacturer, rather than with a, man, with a, a manufacturer of a commercial product, who, if they receive the trade secret, could become a competitor later down the line. I am not certain that treaties per se are going to overcome this. But I'm going to come then to something that, that Yusuf mentioned, which is the ability of countries to either prevent the export or to, for a company to sue governments and this we saw already in 1957 with the flu outbreak that Canada was not going to provide influenza vaccines to the USA until they had vaccinated all the Canadians first. This happened again in 2009 and we see it happening again now. So this ability of either 
countries, uh, companies to sue governments or for governments to say we are blocking any export until we've got complete coverage of our own population, this is going to present a huge barrier. I don't know that we're going to achieve anything in the next 12 to 24 months, which is going to, through, the, through treaties, which is going to enable us to respond quicker to COVID. So rather, I think that we look forwards. We said in 2009 to member states that a pandemic was going to happen. We thought it was going to be flu. It turned out to be coronavirus. But the next pandemic could start next week. It could be influenza. It could be another coronavirus. We need to be getting prepared for that. And this requires that countries see how much damage such pandemics can have and start building the infrastructure because we cannot build infrastructure during a pandemic. So I would like to stop here by saying that it is not, we will not be able to respond now, but we need to be able to prepare for the next pandemic. I'll stop there and hope that it made some sense. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Martine. Now we have uh, one more panelist and uh, before I, I uh, uh, ask the next panelist to speak. I just want to tell everyone in the audience, remind you that if you go in the bottom right hand corner of your Zoom link, you'll see a button called Q&A. Please say your name, introduce yourself and ask a question. Our next panelist is our, uh, the executive director of the South Center uh, that we're co-sponsoring this, this with, Carlos Correa. Well, thank you very much, uh, Kevin. Of course, for the South Center it is a privilege to co-organize this webinar with you, with the center. You have done an excellent work over the years. We appreciate very much uh, the intellectual contribution you are making, presenting new ideas and very good, very solid analysis. So we're very happy to have the opportunity to jointly organize the symposium and also very thankful for the speakers. Let me just uh, make a few comments about the reform of the trade system and the reform of investment agreement, which is the particular subject for this symposium. On the first one, as we know, developed countries have made a number of submissions in order to reform the WTO. This reform, uh, if, uh, if, it were, if it were accepted, would lead to a situation in which the multilateral character of the organization would be undermined. It will impose new disciplines. For instance, you know, there are some negotiations going on on a plurilateral basis on, on e-commerce, and this might be one of the elements of the so-called reform of WTO. There is an attempt to dilute or abolish the special and differential treatment for, for developing countries, which would be a, a major problem for the countries that still need to use what you mentioned correctly, the policy space in order to develop. There is an attempt also to enhance some obligations or notifications, so on and so forth. So all of these reforms have nothing to do with the scenario that we are living up now, and a scenario where emergency is, is something that needs to be addressed. And this reform is not really pro-development. Uh, fortunately, there, there is a number, of, there is a group of developing countries have uh, submitted a counter proposal or a number of counter proposals for these uh, so-called reform by developed countries in which some of the elements I've mentioned are, are referred to in order to preserve the multilateral character of organization and also the very important concept of special and differential treatment. But in any case, all these proposals for reform are pre-COVID-19. So they are not taking in consideration a situation like the one we are living right now, in which you need to ensure that uh, public health, public interest, are prominent, you need to ensure that uh, the trade interests are not uh, overwhelming, are not the main interests that are um, subject to the consideration under the WTO disciplines. Essentially, WTO aims at promoting and protecting trading interests. So the question is, what reform is necessary in order to ensure that in addition to that, or in the context of that, public interest and in particular public health is also promoted and protected in the context of WTO. Uh, if you look at the preamble of the, w, the, of the agreement establishing, establishing the WTO, you will see that there is a general reference to sustainable development and also to taking into account the different levels of development of the member countries. There is no specific reference to the public interest. Um, if we look at the jurisprudence of WTO, there have been a couple of cases, at least in which uh, the public health issue has been uh, taken into account by the panel. One is the 
asbestos case in which uh, against the European communities in which the panel uh, made it clear that the level of protection of public health is a decision to be taken by each member. And more recently, perhaps more importantly, there has been this case in, against uh, Australia on the plain packaging uh, uh, measures in which the panel has, has used the public health uh, as, a, as a justification for the use of Article 20, in particular of the TRIPS agreement. Interestingly, uh, the panel, in a, good, in a good decision, has also um, indicated that the Doha declaration on the TRIPS agreement of public health is a subsequent agreement in the terms of the Vienna Convention. So it has, it, I think this is a very, very important statement because it makes clear that the Doha Declaration has a legal weight in the context of WTO. But besides this, we, we, haven't, we haven't too much. In the WTO, we'll find different kinds of provisions. You find, of course, shall provisions, obligations. You find in some cases, may provisions. So in, in some agreements, you find situations with the clause will say what the members may do. In other cases, you have best endeavors, for instance, many of the S and Ds, special and differential treatment provisions are really best endeavors and not very tight obligations. And then you have exception. Then if you look at the public health situation in the context of WTO, public health is at the, at the lowest level, it's just an exception. As Master King has mentioned, it is subject to some tests, for instance, the test of necessity. And test of necessity has been interpreted in a narrow, in a narrow way. So, one, what I'm proposing is that we need to look again at the, at the whole set of rules in WTO and then ensure that there is an escalation, there is a, an upgrading of the public health related or public interest related more generally provisions in the context of WTO. This will, will of course require innovative ideas. They may, this may require, for instance, a new uh, kind of uh, Doha declaration, but not only apply to trips because Doha, Doha, Doha declaration, as we know, only applies to trips. We may need a, Doha, a type of Doha declaration of public health, which would apply to all the agreements in WTO. We, we may need to, to review more carefully uh, how public health and other public interests can be part of the system and not just the system that promotes and protects the trading interest of the economic actors within the members of WTO. And then finally coming to um, investment agreements, and it has been already mentioned. Well, as we know, there, are now, now, there is now a process going on for the so-called reform of the investment agreements. This is focused in particular now on the investor state dispute system, not very much on the, on the rules. There is a major, there is a real need of reforming the rules under which uh, these invest, investment agreements operate. Uh, in order to ensure that um, uh, public health and other public interests are protected. This is also, has also been mentioned, the, the concept of policy, policy space. So the, the, the investment law is so fragmented, so unpredictable. It is just uh, so much dependent on the interpretations by these ad hoc tribunals that there is no certainty about the way in which uh, essential interests, vital interests of public health can be protected. So in this regard also, we need to look at uh, a reform of the standards for uh, investment agreements. Today, for instance, uh, public health may be considered an exception. Um, one interesting case was the case of Philip Morris against the Uruguay. In the, in the bilateral investment treaty that was uh, relied on by Philip Morris, there was an exception in relation to public health. So the, the BIT said that public health measures were not covered. However, the tribunal found that it had jurisdiction on the issue, despite the exception, because it was narrowly interpreted. So we need to ensure that these measures related to public health are not just narrow exceptions, are part of the rules in investment agreements. The, the, we need to ensure that they can be invoked by, by the parties to these agreements. This will also require some reforms in relation to the concept of uh, what assets are covered. Today, as we know, in many agreements, every asset is covered, including intellectual property, considered an asset. We need to reform the concept of expropriation, in particular, the concept of indirect expropriation, which, which has been applied in such a broad manner. Uh, 
we need to look, of, of course, at, at the concept of fair and equitable treatment. And then there, there is a need of a very serious reform, not only in relation to the dispute settlement system under, under investment agreements, but the sub substantive standards that apply. So we need, uh, I hope that we can continue working together with the center and we can uh, all with the participants too and the speakers develop innovative ideas in order to uh, be able to make proposals post-COVID-19 proposals for reform of uh, W2 rules and also uh, rules in the investment agreements. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much, uh, Carlos, and thank you to all the panelists for your insightful comments. Now I'm gonna open it up to the over 70 folks that are out there uh, from across the world uh, that uh, have been listening to you over the, over the past half hour or so and allow them to ask, ask some questions. For those of you who are out there, just a reminder, if you go into the Q&A button, introduce yourself uh, and ask a question. So let me ask three or four of them and I'll allow the panelists to respond and then we'll see if we can do a, um, another round. So the first question I'll ask is from Mustafa Zir Rahman. He's a distinguished fellow at the Center for Policy Dialogue, a think tank in Dhaka, Bangladesh. And his question is to Mr. Gama. How hopeful are you as regards to mobilizing the needed support for the TRIPS waiver proposal submitted by South Africa, India, and others? Also, there is another proposal on the table to extend the uh, special and differentiated treatment provisions in support of least developing countries following their graduation for an additional 12 years as a support in view of the COVID and structural challenges. What is your expectation and perspectives uh, on these two upcoming uh, discussions at the WTO. We have a question from Dr. Fried, uh, from Peter um, Maberduck, from Public Citizens in the United States. It says, Dr. Frieda, putting aside the question of, of treaties, if, for example, a country has authority in law to compel disclosure of know-how, confidential information, trade secrets, and the public interest, couldn't that be used to open up new manufacturing capacity now in time to mitigate pandemic shortages over the next several years? My understanding is that on current capacity, it will take several years to get vaccines to everyone, meaning there is also time for tech transfer to make a difference. Another question is from Brooke Baker, a law professor at Northeastern University, uh, also here in Boston down the street and a senior policy analyst with Health Gap, an HIV AIDS uh, non-governmental organization. Professor Baker says, not only do intellectual property rules impact supply and price, but the, rule, but the ideas advanced in the trade and investment agreements allow right holders to decide who they will sell to. At present, they prefer powerful and wealthy countries and firms preferentially supply them at, at higher prices. There are no international imperatives to register medical technologies in all countries, nor to equitably distribute scarce medicines, vaccines, et cetera. Can we imagine global solutions to impose an equitable access requirement via government funding contracts and new international treaties governing essential health technologies? And I'll just uh, uh, note one more, Joel Lechin. Uh, he used to teach health policy at York University in Toronto, um, where he's been working on intellectual property rights and trade agreements for a number of years. He's got a comment and a question. Mr. Freed mentioned preparing for the next pandemic. Canada is starting to do that after the SARS crisis in 2003, but after about 15 years without a pandemic, that preparation started to be ignored as the result that Canada was not prepared for COVID. How do we maintain the political will to keep a high degree of preparation if there is no pandemic for a number of years and other health priorities take on more political importance? So why don't we just start with, uh, with Mr. Gama um, and we can go in the order of, uh, of the way folks gave their presentations to respond to, to any of these and we'll see if we have time for another round or so. Uh, Mr. Gama. Yes, uh, thanks, Kevin. Um, so, uh, the question from Bangladesh, I, I think uh, on both fronts, we, um, we're positive. Just uh, quickly on the TRIPS waiver, uh, we had a really big uh, meeting yesterday where we agreed uh, to have an oral, trans uh, an oral report transmitted to the TRIPS Council, um, which uh, the TRIPS Council will consider. Uh, 
And uh, so it, would, it will really be the first time that we are able to articulate our concerns uh, to the highest uh, decision-making body in the absence of the ministerial conference. And so that is a very important moment because we believe that this gives us uh, at least the stage to uh, increase political pressure. Uh, the support uh, for this waiver has been, has been overwhelming, I think, uh, from uh, um, uh, CSOs, uh, from academic institutions, from other international organizations. Um, so we believe that uh, the momentum will carry forward. We have an agreement to continue our discussion. And so hopefully we can bring that uh, to fruition uh, in the near future. I think on the, uh, on the second proposal, I'm not sure which one you're talking about, whether it's the Article 66.1 uh, transition uh, period for LVCs or the Article 7 um, proposal. Uh, on both fronts, we are positive that these should go forward. Uh, it's a question of negotiation, but uh, everyone in the World Trade Organization agrees that LDCs have priority and um, LDC issues should be, should be supported. And so from that perspective, uh, we think uh, issues of special and differential treatment uh, are very important, and especially during COVID, which has uh, really um, emphasized uh, the differences between developed and developing countries. And so uh, taking this into account, uh, we believe that we should be positive going forward. Um, just one comment on, on, on uh, Professor Baker's um, uh, uh, intervention. Uh, certainly agree uh, that uh, something has to be done. Where, where public funding is, uh, is used, I think government should be able to put some strings uh, to whatever is created, whether it's vaccines, technology, and so forth. And so uh, a basic international pool for uh, for uh, technology transfer or um, any of the um, any of the products that may be created from this funding uh, could be an interesting idea. I, I know also colleagues would have suggested that um, if companies benefit from government funding, they should be entitled to shorter periods of patent protection. Uh, so these are all interesting ideas that we could try to contextualize in a post-COVID um, perspective. And uh, I think as Professor Carlos Correa uh, had indicated, this goes across. It's not, it doesn't only talk about investment, uh, the investment regime, it cuts across every aspect uh, of endeavor. And so the issue of um, equality, access, all of these should be uh, built into such a system, uh, but certainly agrees that uh, in the end, uh, we would have to recalibrate existing rules which are not uh, really suited to uh, the current conditions that we face. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Gleason, any comments? Thank you. Uh, I'll address uh, Brooke Baker's question about whether uh, we can imagine any global solutions to impose an equitable access requirement about uh, on government funding contracts and, um, and new international treaties governing essential health technologies. And I, I think that this is a, a really important, um, important issue because it's not just that, uh, you know, the rules in trade and investment agreements often take us in the, uh, the wrong direction in terms of entrenching monopolies and making it more difficult for countries to provide access to uh, affordable technologies. Uh, there's also the problem that we don't actually have the mechanisms that support access in, in other uh, treaties either. And I think that this is a, really an, an area um, that, that needs a lot of attention um, from the World Health Organization and, uh, and something that we, we really need to get a social movement behind. And I think the, the pandemic has created the, uh, the conditions where you know, the whole world is focused on, on this issue at the moment. And I think the timing is really right to get some movement in this area. Interested in what the other panelists think about this question too. Thank you, Professor Vada. Uh, yes, just a brief comment on the issues that uh, Brooke has raised. Um, I think we can agree that the model that is uh, currently you know, reigning in terms of uh, international trade is heavily weighted in, in terms of rights holders and so on. Uh, public health is very much low down the sort of priority. Um, with the 
onset of the pandemic, the notion of and the concept of a people's vaccine, I think, um, elicited a lot of excitement. I think people felt well, here was an opportunity to actually do things, you know, recalibrate, do things differently this time. Uh, lots of promises of uh, funding and so on. But we've seen very quickly how all of that sort of went south because I think, you know, the vested interests very clearly uh, ensured that IP is not going to be uh, touched, uh, that everything would be done within the, very much within the sort of existing framework. I think in that context, what is happening in the WTO is actually quite heartening because in a sense, uh, you know, WTO is being challenged in a very uh, uh, institutional way and you know, from within the institution in terms of its own rules to uh, adopt a different path. And I think that offers some hope. Uh, clearly other institutions need to uh, come you know, up their game as well. Uh, I think there's just widespread disappointment with the World Health Organization and the way in which it has, you know, uh, started very um, strongly in terms of uh, equitable access and whose, you know, performance has really not sort of uh, stayed the course. Uh, so I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Frieda. Okay, thanks. So I just, you know, the questions that were asked there, I'm going to First of all, answer, try and answer Joel Lection's question. And Joel, thank you for the question. Also, thank you for your many publications, many of which have uh, been very useful to us at WHO. So you, you highlight that during the last SARS outbreak, Canada began preparing, and then over time, Canada lost the interest. And this highlights one of the big challenges we've had for influenza, for SARS and other things, that you cannot build a factory that is waiting for a pandemic. This, we, we, we maintain armies waiting for wars, but that's about the only thing we're able to do. We have not been able to build factories that are waiting for the pandemic and not doing anything else. These factories, in the end, turn to dust. So what I would like to suggest, and, and I think really COVID has given us now, it's, it's, it's a horrible pandemic, but it's given us a few solutions which I think are going to be critical in the future. And it is in the future that the IP, which we're discussing now, is going to play a role. So I'm just going to throw out something. That one technology which we are seeing very promising for COVID is the messenger RNA vaccine technology. Now, this we've been talking about this for the last five years, but nobody was really investing in it. It suddenly ha has come to a fall through COVID. Now, in theory, such a facility that is making mRNA vaccines could also be making other vaccines that it sells on a, I call it Monday to Friday basis. Let's say that they sell another vaccine, which is sold on, on an annual basis, on a daily basis. For example, an HPV vaccine, a polio vaccine, using the technology. And then in the event of an outbreak, they would apply this to that technology, to, to the outbreak. This would be, be work for flu, this would work for, for COVID, this would work for other types of viral vaccines. So we now have the technology that would enable countries to be able to maintain sustainability. And this has been the problem. All of the previous approaches were not sustainable because we were prepared, we were trying to remain prepared for something that wasn't happening. Now, this is not going to work if Canada is the only country that is able to produce mRNA vaccines, as an example. So what we're going to need, and this is now answering a little bit the question from Peter also, we cannot overnight transfer the, the know-how for mRNA to Senegal. I choose Senegal as an example. It is one of the few countries of which I'm aware that has domestic vaccine production that does not currently have plans for a COVID vaccine. And one of the reasons for this, all of the other countries with domestic vaccine production have been able to at least enter some kind of discussion or already have signed agreements for tech transfer for candidate COVID, for COVID vaccines. Now, we don't know which COVID vaccines are going to be the best. And so some of them may have signed deals or, or contracts with, with, men, with developers whose vaccines are not going to be the best or whose vaccines might not even work. But this is the nature of this of, of what we're getting through for the moment. But what we would want is that we have a technology like mRNA or something else which can be applied to a future pandemic where all countries that want are able to establish a facility and to use that technology to keep the facility sustainable. Now we won't be able to get this done in 192 countries 
because that will not be viable. So we're going to have to have methods whereby regions work on a regional health security, not a national health security. And this comes back to what we spoke earlier, uh, Yusuf mentioned about countries saying, I will not permit export until I vaccinated everybody in my country. So then just the final thing, which is on, can we impose tra a trade secret transfer? I've done many technology transfers and facilitated these in my life from north to south, south to south, and even south to north. You cannot impose the trade, trans the trade secret transfer. This has to be done on a win-win basis. Unfortunately, I don't know that we would ever get really effective trade secret transfer through a legal imposition. And then the question is, which if, if, the, if the country, let's take a South country says, I'm able to impose it, but the person who owns a trade secret is in the North, that's not going to work very well. And having left industry before with my own, with trade secrets in my head, which I then sought to transfer to other people, this is not something that happens overnight. So once again, I want to come back to my message. We now need to be planning for the future. I think COVID is giving us the opportunity to plan for the future. IP will come into this, but it is in the planning for the future, not planning for now. Thank you. Thank you. Carlos. Yes, well, I would like to refer to this uh, last issue about the transfer of know-how or trade secrets. Certainly then uh, there is a de facto monopoly by the possessor of the know-how, we, we shouldn't, shouldn't talk about the owner because there is no real ownership. However, uh, in the United States, there have been interesting precedents in which the Federal Trade Commission forced companies to uh, transfer trade secrets. There were many in the, in the 90s, uh, and there was a most recent case in the case uh, Malincroft in 2017, in which the Federal Trade Commission, in the context of an investigation of, for antitrust violation, it actually forced the company to transfer the know-how or trade secret. Of course, Martin may say, well, maybe the transfer will, will be not a full, there will be some reluctance, but uh, hopefully there will be some sanctions and remedies in case that this happens. So I don't think it's conceivable that trade secret protection will be more absolute than other types of protection for intellectual property. In the case of patents, you have compulsory licensing. In the case of trade secrets, this compulsory license is not provided for in, in the laws, but this should not mean that there cannot be a kind of forced or compulsory transfer of know-how. So I think we need to explore this more and to ensure that competition law or other regulations are applied in cases that there is a refusal to transfer vital technology as, as, as it may be the case for the production of vaccines. Uh, interestingly, the Department of Finance of Switzerland commissioned a study uh, to a group of experts which was published in 2018 uh, about uh, the protection and use of technical information. In this study, the Swiss experts actually recommended to introduce compulsory licensing for technical information. Uh, so therefore, I think we need to think more about this to ensure that competition law is applied in cases that there is a need to uh, have this compulsory transfer of know-how. Otherwise, you will just depend, uh, as Martin said, I fully agree in the case of, of, of um, certain um, antibiotics, in the case of uh, vaccines, in the case of biologicals in general, you are very much dependent on uh, access to uh, trade secrets and know-how. But I think there must be legal solutions to this. And the, the second comment I'd like to make is in relation to uh, Rubeisker's question about a uh, new international treaty in particular, there is a very, a very risky or dangerous situation in which there might be a vaccine or a, a monoclonal antibody available, and the company just decides not to register it, and therefore it would not be possible to commercialize a particular product which may be vital. And this also needs to be addressed. Uh, this, this may be also one of the cases in which intellectual property patents or test data in cases that are protected under exclusivity could be a, a clear barrier for access to medicines. So this is another dimension I think we need to work on, regulatory provisions in relation to access to medicines, in addition to intellectual property, maybe one of the barriers that uh, countries may face in order to ensure access to medicines or vaccines for this pandemic or for other diseases. We, we need to ensure a, a solution that not only addresses this, this, the current situation, but uh, 
in the in the longer longer term address or other situations too. Thank you very much. I think we uh, I think we've got a, a, some time for another round. And there's a number of, a number of other questions here. Uh, here's one from Anthony Hill, and he asks uh, if China did not exist. Which other developing countries would actually be able to contribute by manufacturing and providing other developing countries with the necessary access to devices and essential medicines in a manner that uh, donor, uh, other than a donor slash beneficiary basis? Uh, Katie Galigley Swan, uh, who's actually a, a policy coordinator here at the Global Development Policy Center in a joint project that we have with UNCTAD, asks uh, What is the relevance of this discussion to climate change? There are a lot of the same barriers in terms of policy space and the barriers to the transfer of green technologies for developing economies to respond to the scale and to the global climate challenge. Can anyone on the panel speak to this connection and how can we connect the current vaccine crisis to other expedient policy challenges in the world? I have a question from Oliver Williams, policy advisor in the Drug Resist Resistant Infections Program at Wellcome Trust. His question is to Martine. If IP is not a significant barrier to access to COVID products at the moment, is there a need for a CTAP mechanism or would efforts be better spent elsewhere? And if so, what role does the non-private sector or the public sector play in ensuring that developers sign licensing agreements with manufacturers to ensure access in lower and middle income countries. I have a question by Rachel Thrasher, a legal scholar at the GDP Center, asks Dr. Frieda, uh, mentioned the importance of building production capacity for the future, looking at getting ready for the next pandemic. However, many countries are limited in the policies they can put in place to build up their pharmaceutical manufacturing capacities as a result of their treaty commitments both at the WTO and in bilateral and regional treaties. Given that, we should be looking at and preparing for the future, how do panelists think treaties might play a role in facilitating that preparation, especially if reform were to make space for more development policy in lower and middle income countries? Um, I've got, uh, I, I see that some people have their hands up in the participant uh, area that uh, with this webinar, we're asking folks to type in some questions under the Q&A component. Um, why don't I ask the, the panelists to respond to those, and then there's a couple more if we have some, uh, some, some time. Uh, we can go back in the order uh, of, of, of when folks uh, started. So how about uh, Mr. Gama? Thank you. Well, uh, thanks. Uh, uh, thanks, Martin. I, I think, um, you know, all, all the issues that, that would have been raised are, uh, are quite important. Um, uh, I think Rachel is at least uh, the question around China. If China didn't exist, uh, you know, which developing country would be able to uh, facilitate the, the transfer of technology and so forth? I, I just wanted to say that's perhaps uh, an insidious uh, a view of the situation because if it was not for the efforts of developed countries to actually systematically block the transfer of technology and, and, and the sharing of knowledge, I don't think that we would find ourselves in, in this situation. So I think the question is perhaps posed in a, in a bit of a lopsided way. Um, but nonetheless, I, I think there are a few developing countries that have the potential, that have the resources to do so. Uh, we have heard um, <clears throat> claims around mRNA technology being difficult uh, to take transfer but there are several developing countries already doing it. Um, and so from that perspective, if it wasn't just for the IP barriers, I think more developing countries would have uh, this capacity. And so from that perspective, I think, you know, we also need to recalibrate the type of discussions that we have. We always hear there is no capacity in the developing world, but that is not correct. Many of the products that are used in the West actually produced in the developing world. Uh, countries such as Bangladesh, for example, you know, are producing uh, many quality products. And so I think that narrative is, is totally wrong and, and unacceptable. Thank you very much. Professor Gleason. Um, I'll, I'll address Katie's um, question about 
climate change. And, and I think that, um, you know, with all of these things, we need to be thinking about um, how do we protect the environment at the same time as we're thinking about how do we protect health. Um, and I think that um, Carlos's uh, suggestion earlier that we think about, um, you know, another international agreement like the Doha Declaration that, that applies to all of the WTO agreements is a, is a really excellent um, suggestion. And I think that, that anything like that that applies to um, health also needs to apply to the environment because fundamentally um, our, our health depends um, on the health of the environment. So we need to be thinking about um, those things together rather than separately. Thank you. Professor Vada. Yes, I think I'm, I'm going to uh, comment on issues raised by uh, Rachel and, and, and perhaps uh, some more. Um, I think an important sort of distinction and uh, what appears as, as a big contradiction is that in the 10 months or so of the pandemic, uh, there's been incredible advances in, in science. And I think a, a phenomenal amount of open science and open sharing, which has brought us to you know five or so viable vaccines uh, you know, right on our doorstep. But at the same time, the control and the propriety, uh, propriety you know, control of all of this is now located within industry. And I think that that stands out as a, as a very fundamental contradiction in the way in which this is playing out. Uh, so what role can tr treaties play in facilitating preparation for future pandemics and, and being you know, in a better situation? Uh, obviously we have to change that uh, model and perhaps it's time to look at uh, ideas like the research and development treaty, which might enable us to recalibrate things so that there can be proper pandemic preparedness, there can be proper investment in, in those areas of research and so on. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Fred. Okay, thanks. I, I, I hope I, I captured the questions properly, but I'm, I'm going to maybe just begin with, with something that Mustakim said, you know, that some, several of the developing countries are producing mRNA and that's absolutely correct. So India is producing mRNA vaccines, China has mRNA vaccines. Um, one of the barriers that we've seen with technology transfer, first of all, is the ability to receive technology. So um, over the last 15 years, we've seen a huge improvement in the ability of developing countries to receive technology, but we also still see many of the low and middle income countries that do not have the necessary human resources or infrastructure to act to, to receive technology. So you, it's difficult doing technology transfer if there is not already the capacity to receive the technology. So going forwards, we have to be building the ability of countries to receive the technology. I saw there were some comments in the chat about how do we build this? And I want to come back to this concept of sustainability, that we have to be identifying technologies which enable the country to be able to produce something that it sells. So it must be able to, if it's internal market, external market, doesn't matter, but it must be able to sell. Now to come back to the question on the role of CTAPs, since it's so difficult. So first of all, the, for the diagnostics and for some of the drugs, the tech transfer is a much faster. You can do it, the tech transfer for a diagnostic within a matter of months, whereas the tech transfer for a vaccine can take two, three, four, five years. And we've had some examples taking even longer. So, so CTAP, first of all, plays a critical role, diagnostics, therapeutics. But CTAP also has a role to play now in vaccines and in drugs. But it's, you know, it's going to be really two countries that have the infrastructure in place. It's going to be very difficult within the next two years to build the infrastructure, to receive the technology for these biologicals and to get these through the approval process. And I want to come back to what I said previously about why some of the companies have chosen to use a contract manufacturer. And this comes back to, to the state, to the trade secrets. And Carlos, you're the expert on this. So I, I bow to you on, on what can be done. But I'm just going to come back to what the willingness for the moment of the originators to transfer their trade secrets to a contract manufacturer, whereas there may be a reticence for them to transfer it to a 
group that could be a future competitor. So contract manufacturer typically will not become a competitor, but another vaccine manufacturer or monoclonal antibody manufacturer could become a competitor. So I don't know how we're going to manage that. Carlos, I really bow to you on this. You are the expert. But we have seen the transfer of the, know, the complete know-how, but it is to an entity where the originator does not see them becoming a competitor. So this is beyond my area of expertise, um, but maybe we need to be looking at to, to then build in, how does the originator ensure that the recipient doesn't then become a competitor? And whether we're looking at this or whether we're looking at the Europe, UK negotiations, which are occupying all the newspapers here, I think it comes down very much to the same thing. We are willing to share on the hope that you don't then come back and stamp on us. So maybe this is something that we also need to think about. How do we facilitate um, transfer of know-how and knowledge while uh, protecting the originator from not then being um, uh, eliminated by a new competitor that he's just created. I, I hope that's answered the questions. Thank you so much, Carlos. Well, yes, uh, let me try to respond at least to two questions. One in connection with uh, climate change and transfer of technology. Uh, I fully agree, the transfer of technology as it was already mentioned is not just a problem that affects uh, technology for pharmaceuticals or vaccines, it's a more general problem. In the case of climate change technology, although there has been an obligation on developed countries to transfer technology under the framework convention of climate change, this, this has not happened. One of the reasons, as Martin is, is mentioning, is that the owners of technology don't want to create their own competitors at the global scale. And there has been a strong reluctance by companies to transfer technology. As you may recall, in the, in the 70s, there was an attempt by Antal to develop a code of conduct on international transfer of technology, which finally failed. But I think it's imperative for um, the international community to put it back on the agenda, the issue of transfer of technology. The mechanism that is set up in the context of the Agenda 2030 may be useful, but they do not provide a full solution to this. And the second aspect I'd like to, uh, to respond to is this question about um, building uh, production capacity in developing countries, if, if China were not there. Uh, so let me mention uh, in relation to Martin's comment uh, that uh, contract manufacturing will not in the end compete. In fact, the experience of South Korea does show the contrary. As you know, the, in electronics, uh, in electronics, the companies today, very important ones, learn through uh, manufacturing, through contract manufacturing. They, they were subject to the what's called OEM agreements, but you, you cannot prevent the company to learn and therefore to uh, improve their technologies and then to become eventually uh, a competitor. See, this will not be prevented any, even under contractual clauses. So therefore it may be a strategy. I understand that uh, there is this reluctance by companies to share the know-how with uh, pot potential competitors, but this is precisely the problem. So you did mention that you need absorption capacity. You need the capacity in the developing country to receive technology. But as you said, uh, why are you going to create capacity if nobody is willing to provide you the technology to use this capacity? So the lack of absorption capacity is also reflecting the lack of supply of technology. So we need to address this problem, taking into account both sides. Absorption capacity, uh, I fully agree, is very, is very important, but also to show that this is supply of technology. And therefore, we need to put back on, on the agenda and look for solutions in relation to technology transfer. Just one last comment in uh, connection with manufacturing capacity in developing countries, as Mosta King has mentioned, in fact, uh, many developed countries, in particular the European Union and the United States, learned through the COVID-19 that they were so dependent on the supplies of medicines produced in China and, and uh, in India that they, they decided now to, to put in place policies in order to ensure sovereignty in the production of medicines. In the case of many products in the United States or European Union, 80 or 90% of the active ingredients are provided by China or India. This is the case, for instance, of antibi antibiotics. 
So this, this shows, as Master King has mentioned, that there is capacity in developing countries to produce, including some complex technologies, as it takes, for instance, for instance, of India in, in the area of, of, of vaccines. Therefore, what we may need to think in terms of reform is to reform the, the mechanism that was put in place under Article 31B. As, as you remember, this was the outcome of a waiver. This, this Article, Article 31B is too cumbersome. It does not allow a fast transfer of technology. It does not allow a, a fast transfer of the, the knowledge and the rights in order to produce in the countries without manufacturing capacity. So we need to look at this again. In my view, we should propose and we should uh, make it clear that an exception under Article 30 for exports should be allowed under the CHIPS agreement. I, I actually wrote a paper recently on this, arguing that beyond Article 31B, exports will not imply any violation of the domestic rights of a patent holder. And therefore the exports could be done uh, without the limitations, very serious limitations imposed by Article 31. This should be part of the reform of the trade system in order to ensure uh, access to uh, medicines in, in a fast and in, 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 in full manner. Thank you. Thank you so much. We've only got about uh, five to eight minutes. So I wonder if I could ask the panelists uh, to undergo what I'd call a lightning round of final remarks. Um, uh, we'll go in the order of um, uh, that we started the entire event with. And if I could just say, if could each panelist say, what is the number one most important immediate reform and the number one most important intermediate, more structural reform that we'd like to see happen in 2021? And we'll start with Dr. Gum. Yes, I think the most immediate uh, reform that we need is to pass the waiver. This will enable us to address the pandemic. But in the waiver, we also have uh, some formula for ongoing discussion to further clarify international rules. I think as many of the panelists emphasize, um, in the long run, we would have to agree on a new consensus. Uh, this is a post COVID consensus. And so from that perspective, uh, across all pillars uh, of engagement, uh, this needs to be a reality. I think what uh, uh, Professor Correa mentioned about a new DOA declaration in respect of further clarification uh, and retrofitting uh, the current inappropriate uh, rules uh, to the new reality is going to be important. And so from that perspective, I think uh, the issue of inclusivity of access um, would be quite important to address uh, in the near future. Thank you very much. Professor Gleason. Thank you. I agree that the TRIPS waiver is the most important thing that needs to be done right now to address the problem. It's, it's really, you know, we've We've tried voluntary mechanisms. Um, we've had CTAP now for how many months and how many pharmaceutical companies have voluntarily, um, you know, contributed their, their IP um, using, using those sort of mechanisms. I think we really need um, the TRIPS waiver to enable um, the, that technology transfer to happen. Um, in the longer term, I think it's um, much harder to say what's actually the most important um, thing that can be done because there's so much um, that needs to be done to, to really reshape the whole um, trade and investment regime. Um, I think that, uh, you know, Ka Carlos's suggestion for um, an, another Doha declaration type instrument is, is a really important one, um, along with thinking about um, how do we reshape the funding of pharmaceutical R&D. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Bada. Yes, I agree in the immediate uh, term, uh, the waiver. In the, in the longer term, I think we have to recognize that we are dealing with uh, immense sort of economic and, and power asymmetries. So in the trade negotiations and trade treaties that are you know, coming down the line, that will play out in, in a particular way. Uh, and I think in that connection, what's going to be very important is for particularly developing countries and at least developed countries to harness their, their collective world and power to um, help to rewrite the sort of trade rules and to clarify uh, rules as, as we go forward. I think we've seen it from time to time. We saw it in Doha. We're seeing it to some extent in the uh, waiver movement uh, at the moment, uh, but that needs to, to be taken on. Uh, 
Thank you, Dr. Frieda. Hey, well, you're, you're the trade experts. I, I double in IP and trade. So I'm going to really try and reiterate what I said previously. The biggest barrier that I see going forwards is, is the lack of capacity in developing countries. And Carlos very rightly said, so how do we, how do we get this up? And I think what we tried to communicate in 2005, Carlos was actually with us in 2005 when we were doing the H5N1 IP problems and 2009, was trying to warn governments of what the cost was going to be when the pandemic comes. And I don't think any of them really believed this. I think now they're seeing, and actually this is a small pandemic, the next one could be much worse. So. What I personally would like to see is that governments, all of them, really put aside the, the necessary investment to build the capacity in the, in the, the low and middle income countries so that they can acquire technology. So it's all, it's not about responding now to COVID. It's about being ready to respond to the next pandemic because I think we will be out of this, I hope we'll be out of COVID in the next 24 to 36 months but the next one could be much worse. So um, really, I just like to see better investment. Over. Thank you very much. And Carlos. Kevin, thank, thank you again. Of, of course, I fully agree. The waiver is the immediate uh, measure that needs to be taken, that there is an urgency to do that and, and to support this. Uh, the next one, I think, is to uh, work in order to avoid that public health is just a narrow exception in the context of uh, the WTO system. So, unfortunately, the international law system is too fragmented. Then you have WTO on one side, you have human rights, then you have intellectual property. We, we need to ensure that there is, uh, there is a substantive interconnection. We need to ensure that uh, public health is not just something that... Uh, you need to prove in, in, with, very, with very narrow limits that there is a reason in order to justify measures that uh, you, you can take in WTO. So I think this, this, is, this is needed. This might include the revision of Article 31 b and also possibility of using uh, exceptions under Article 30, for instance, in particular for exports, which may be needed. As I mentioned, uh, there is a need to rethink the whole WTO system under a new perspective of what I mentioned, a, a possible new Doha declaration, not only apply to chips. I think these are the immediate um, reforms that we need in the context of uh, investment agreements. As I mentioned, it's imperative to, uh, to correct some of the clauses in investment agreements, uh, including on ind indirect expropriation, on definition of assets and so on and so forth. But there is a lot already proposed in this, in this regard, but this must be implemented not only in, in new agreements, but also I think we, sh we should push for the reform. South Africa, as you mentioned, but Master Kim decided to cut off a number of agreements. This could be a good solution. If this is not done in any case, there will be some reform of the existing agreements in order to ensure that there is policy space in order to implement uh, public health and other public interest policies. Thank you very much. Well, I really want to uh, thank all of the panelists and all of the attendees uh, for a very rich and important discussion uh, that certainly won't end here, but I hope we're able to advance some important ideas uh, as we move forward into 2021. In the chat on the right here, uh, staff of the GDP Center have put in links to South Center publications, ways to find out about what the South Center is doing on these issues, and also links to the GDP Center's work on this. We've actually created something called the Working Group on Trade and Investment Treaties and Access to Medicines, which is a loose working group of academics and scholars from across the world that try to bring a data-driven data and empirical analysis uh, to these policy debates and to diffuse them into the, into the policy sphere so we can have more uh, data-based, empirical-based conversations about this uh, as we have today. I wish uh, everybody uh, a wonderful end to 2020. And let's hope that, uh, uh, as Dr. Frieda said, we can move towards a 2021, where in 36 months or so, we might, uh, we might be away from this virus. But let's also make sure that we prepare uh, in a way to prevent and mitigate the next one uh, in a way that allows countries to have the fiscal and policy space uh, to be able to prevent, mitigate, not only prevent and mitigate uh, pandemics and crises like these, but to accelerate a development process that allows countries to be able to reach their full potential.
thank you so much, everyone, both panelists uh, and attendees, and uh, wish you the best of 2021. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.